Hallelujah and blessings in Jesus, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life, and Jesus is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And with grateful hearts, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, today we are continuing our study in the book of Galatians, and it is really starting to get good. Now, of course, as with any letter, Paul has an introduction, he has an opening, and then he starts to get into the meat of the letter, what the real purpose of the letter is, and then as he ends the letter, he'll get closer to finalizing, saying farewell until the next time that they can meet or talk again, just as we would in a letter. And so today we are in chapter four, which pretty much means we're right in the middle of this, but Paul is right on the end of establishing his argument. And again, remember, his argument is law against grace. The Jewish faith against the now Jesus Jewish faith, which we know as Christianity. And the line that separates the two is so minute and so obscure that it is hard to detect the difference. And yet it is so profound that if you have lived under the law, the rule of the law, the obligation to observing all the law each and every moment of your lives, and now you're able to step in the grace and liberty that Jesus and the Spirit of God brings and allows us, the difference between the two is the same as between day and night. And that's actually probably a good representation because the law in many ways is dark, it's cold, it can be overbearing, and it's easy for us to lose our way within. But grace is pictured through the sun, S-O-N, but is pictured as the sun, S-U-N. It's full of life. It's full of vibrancy. It's like coming out of the cold, dark days of winter, waking up and realizing it's spring. Butterflies are flying Flowers are blooming, the sun is out, the sky is blue, the clouds are white. And that is what Paul is trying to explain to these young Christians who are hearing his message on one side, and yet because he's not their full-time pastor, when he departs, the Jews swarm in and they begin to whisper and to speak all these things from the old Jewish law and they're caught in the middle, and they honestly don't know what to do. You may have felt like that in the past. I know that I certainly have. I only want to honor God, and I want to be true to what he tells me. And yet, when we read the Old Testament, and we move into the New Testament, and we begin to read the message of Jesus that he brings to the new fellowship, it's a stark difference between the two. And I guess the only way that you can truly recognize it is to leave behind the old way and to step in out on faith into the new way. And once you begin to experience the liberty of the spirit, you're never going to want to go back. It's like a prisoner being freed from his cell or a lion being freed from his cage. Once he experiences the jungle for himself, he's never going to come back on his own into that cage, nor will the prisoner into his cell. And so elaborating as I have on what Paul is saying, let's just dive right in today. Galatians chapter 4 and verse 21 is where we'll pick up, and we're going to try to make it down to chapter 5 verse 1, which is only about 10 verses. Verse 21, he says, tell me. You that desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? Have you not read the law? If you sit under a man's teaching who is teaching the law, when you leave, you feel like you're bound in chains. But when you sit under the ministry of a man who is teaching about the liberty of the Spirit, walking in a passionate relationship with Jesus Christ, you walk out feeling born again. He continues in verse 22. He says, For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. 
but he of the free woman was by promise. And then he starts verse 24 by saying, these things are an allegory. So basically, these are a story within a story. We have a real life event, but through this event, we see a picture of what is to come. So let's look at that for a moment. God comes to Abraham and says, Abraham, you're going to have a son. And Abraham says, I take you at your word and I believe you. He also tells Sarah, Abraham's wife, they're going to have a son. Now you have to realize that they're old in age. I mean, right around the age of 75 years old when they receive this promise. And because of knowing their age, Sarah laughs at God when she hears this. And of course, you know the story, God calls her on it. But the point is, is that depending on which theologian or Bible scholar you listen to, it was somewhere between six and 10 years before Sarah took matters in her own hands. I mean, she's old in age. She desires a child. God has promised a child. She has waited for six to 10 years and there has been no child. So out of frustration, she goes to Abraham and says, I want you to sleep with your handmaiden. Now in Western culture, we don't practice these things today, but back then this was a common practice to have handmaidens, to have concubines. Now we weren't there and we don't know actually what took place or why Abraham acted on behalf of doing what Sarah told him to do, but he does. He goes in and he has sexual relations with his handmaiden, Hagar. But God has promised Sarah a son. Well, of course, Hagar has this son named Ishmael. And then four to five years later, God does fulfill his promise to Sarah. Sarah does bear a child, and his name is Isaac. Now, through the story, Hagar is creating problems with Sarah. So Sarah goes to Abraham and says, cast Hagar out. He is not a promised child, being Ishmael. He will not be heir to anything that you have. He and his mother are only a burden upon us, so cast them away. And Abraham is grieved in his heart as any father would be. But God tells Abraham to honor Sarah's wishes, so he does. Now, in this true life event, which you can read Genesis chapter 16 and in a little bit further, if you would like to better understand the story. But inside this true story, Paul is going to use an illustration based on that story to talk about law and grace. And that's what he does. He says, he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. He was not born after the promise of God. He was born after the wishes of men, being Sarah specifically, trying to hurry up and have a child, trying to help God. But then he says, he of the free woman, Sarah, was by promise. He is the promised one. He is the one through whom all nations will be blessed. Not Ishmael, Isaac. Now from Ishmael's seed will come many nations, but he is not the promised child. He is not the one whose seed will bring the promised one, the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. That belongs to Isaac. Now in verse 24, Paul says, these things are an allegory for these are the two covenants. So Ishmael represents the first covenant, the Old Testament, and Isaac represents the new covenant, the New Testament. He says the one will come from Mount Sinai, which is the law which Moses received from Yahweh, and this will lead to bondage, which is Agar. And so he's saying this is represented by Hagar and her son Ishmael. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So the Old Testament answers to the New Testament in our allegory here. The New Testament doesn't bend the knee to the Old Testament. The Old Testament bends the knee to the New Testament. If the New Testament is master, the Old Testament is servant. And yet, the New Testament is represented by Jerusalem. The Old Testament is represented by Mount Sinai. But the Old Testament is in bondage. He goes on in verse 26, he says, But Jerusalem, the New Testament, the new covenant, which is above, is free. And she is the mother of us all. 
So freedom is our way, not bondage. For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not. Break forth and cry, thou that travelest not. For the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. So it appears here that Paul is saying, as it is written in the Old Testament, the mightier nations the more plenteous people will come from the seed of Ishmael. But just because there are more in number doesn't necessarily mean that that's whom God favors. God has always been one for, for lack of a better way of saying it, the underdog. I mean, do you remember, I, I believe it was Gideon that was about to go into battle and he had chosen some 30,000 men and God said, no, that's too many. You will take credit for the defeat if you go with that many. So I want you to bring it all the way down to 300. And when your 300 go against 30,000 and you win, then I, Yahweh, the Most High, the Almighty, the Ageless One, I will receive all the glory. And that's why Paul tells us in the book of Romans, God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Now, I may have been just a little bit off on the illustration that I used from the Bible, from the story of Gideon and that army, but the point is the same. God uses few to accomplish more, and that's the way he always works. I mean, look at Messiah himself. Messiah wasn't born in a palace. He was born in a shepherd's stall, and yet he is the lamb of glory. Where else would we expect a lamb to be born? He continues in verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, we are the children of promise. So he's saying the New Testament saint, the New Testament Christian, the follower of the Lord Jesus is of the promise. Not the Jew that's bound in his law. He's still fighting to get out of bondage. And yet the deliverer has come and yet he is persistent in remaining bound to the law. He says in verse 29, but as then he that was born after the flesh, that would be Ishmael, persecuted him that was born after the spirit, Isaac, even so it is now. The Jews are still persecuting the Christian. It wasn't the Christian, the new follower of Jesus that was trying to eliminate the Jews. It was the Jews that were trying to stop the message of Jesus, of Christianity. And they began by hanging Jesus on a cross. They continued by stoning Stephen, then by killing the disciples and ultimately killing Paul. He says in verse 30, Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman, or the law, and her son, for the son of the bondwoman, or the law, shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. They cannot coexist. Just like Sarah could not coexist with Hagar, the liberty in Jesus cannot coexist with the law. You're either on one side or the other. You're bound to the law, and if you are bound to the law, then you are bound to the whole law, and if you offend in one point, you have broken all, or you stand in liberty, striving for perfection and maturity in the Lord Jesus Christ, and going to him in confession and prayer when you fail but not using your opportunity of forgiveness to continue in such unholy lifestyles, but to truly press for perfection and maturity in all that you do, doing everything to guard your soul to ensure you do not do things that are displeasing to the Father, to His Son, the Lord Jesus, or to the Holy Spirit. He says in verse 31, So then, brethren, based upon everything we've said, we are not children of the law or the bondwoman, but we are children of the free. And praise be to God, praise be to the Lord Jesus Christ for that fact. We are free. And if we understood our liberty, how different the world around us would look and how different the world around us would be. We have something every man, every woman, every boy, every girl wants. But if there's nothing attractive about our relationship with the Lord Jesus, why do we think that they would want it? And then he finishes in 
Now, I say he finishes. In our Bibles, we have the end of chapter 4 and we begin chapter 5. But only up till about three, 400 years ago, these verses and chapters were placed in these writings. This was just one long letter. So in stating everything that we've talked about today, stand fast, therefore, knowing this, knowing what you have just learned, stand fast in the liberty, not in the law, stand fast in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Be not entangled again with the yoke of the law. Celebrate your freedom in Jesus Christ. And I mean, friend, really celebrate your freedom in the Lord Jesus Christ. Walk as a new man, a man who once carried a 500-pound weight on his back. And all of a sudden, that burden falls off, that weight falls off. How free you would feel. How light you would be in the way that you walk, in the way that you talk, in the way that you react to the things around you. You are a child of the living God who has been set free under the person of Jesus. What more could you want to celebrate? Praise be to God for the great things that he has done for his people. Well, friends, we're going to end there today. We'll pick up next time at the beginning of chapter 5. And let me just say, I truly pray that your eyes are being opened that you're really starting to see this. Because even in mainstream denominationalism, Baptist, Methodist, Lutheran, and other such movements, you will find many who live under the law. And yet you will find those in like the charismatic movement, the Pentecostal movement, who are so free and at liberty in Jesus Christ that they have forsaken aspects of the law. And what we are to do is to find that obscure fine line that runs right through the middle of law and grace, and we are to stand perfectly at ease, standing fast upon that line, understanding what the law is and how important it is to our relationship to Jesus, because he said, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Commandments are law, friends. But at the same time, we understand the liberty that we're not under obligation to do what Jesus wants us to do, but because we love him, we desire to do what he wants to do. That's the kicker, friends. That's what it all boils down to. And that simplifies it in my mind, in my heart, in my soul, and I trust it does the same for you. Well, I love you, friends. I pray that your journey today will be blessed through Jesus. I pray that your heart will be full of the Spirit of God and the joy that he brings and that each and everything you do today will bring him honor, praise, and glory for he alone truly is worthy. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I'll see you on the next video.